Welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen. It's really two programs in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a program about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colorful. Maximize the flavor. OK, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimize the risk. So welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. Hey, welcome back, and, and this time I think you may be just possibly getting a certain amount of deja vu. It's like, have I seen this before? I've seen this before. Well, you might have seen it before if you were in New Zealand in 1961. Now, in 1961, this is me on the set of my very first television kitchen. I started in 1960 in New Zealand on television. And, um, and I made a, a dish called the Peacemaker, Le Mediatrice. And uh, was, as you can see, if you sort of get in really close on that, it is a loaf of bread, and it is filled with oysters and bacon and, and mayonnaise. Oh, I mean, just fantastic. Well, anyway, um, why do I raise that? Well, I got a letter just the other day, you know, in amongst all of these individual food preference things we've been sending out, and it came from Lenane. And uh, Lenane Haley, hello, Lenane. Um, some years ago, you demonstrated what turned out to be a family favorite, the Peacemaker. Now, this was an oyster, bacon, and tomato sandwich made in a garlic butter coated hollowed out bread and served with a horseradish laced mayonnaise. I love the way you put that. Um, sauce for each slice. It was so nice to know that these silver bullets, because it's wrapped in foil, uh, were waiting in the fridge when you got home. And you had seven children, so I, boy, I bet that that was um, popular. You know, if you haven't, could you devise an equally tasteful but currently acceptable, I love the way you put that, um, version? I'm sure it would be, people would be very happy. Well, fine. There we are. Um, I've done it. And uh, so I had a look at your little things, and let's do it, favorite things. USA Southern cooking, a um, little bit less now. Filled breads you like. Silver bullets I put down as your recipe. Horseradish, obviously, you enjoy. Oysters must be a big deal in your life. By the way, if oysters are not a big deal in yours. You know the whole principle behind springboarding is look at the technique and then put your own ingredients in its place. So think other ingredients as I'm using the oysters if you don't like it. Don't just go like this and stop it. This is too good a thing to miss. All right? And crusty bread is something that you really enjoy and don't we all somehow? I do. All right? Ready for the dish? Come on through. You know, in all of these things that we do, we have a springboard idea, which really is supposed to do one thing, to lower the risks for you, and yet to increase the pleasure that you get from food at the same time. So, let's look at some things which are very pleasurable, but would have a little bit of a risk with them, okay? And I'm not here to condemn them at all, but just here to lift them up. This one is called a crustade, and this is what the French use, and other people around the world use it as well because of them. And you just carve it out, make a little sort of casing, a bit of a fiddle but to do it, but it, it works. And then you deep fry that in oil. If you just put, put it in, into the oil pot and watch the surface go <laughs> like this as it goes into the dish. It, obviously, crusty, beautiful, filled with creamed brains and sweetbreads. Uh, lovely little things like that. A very thick, creamy sauce so that the crunch of the crustade comes up with a smoothness. Huh? Then this is a vol a puff of wind, you know, as a French will say. Just a, a mere delicatessen thing, which we have uh, yeah, like this, and it will blow off the plate um, if it wasn't weighed down by something equally rich. So that's popped onto the top, and they usually make little mouth-sized ones for cocktail parties where you can just pop it into your mouth. Hello, darling. Like this, like this, and you're ready with the next inanity. So that's done. Now, you could also have... Um, with this, we run the flag up the flagpole and play Stars and Stripes Forever. And this is apple pie. I mean, you know, come on. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about this at all. But this, the volavant and the crustade, all things which wrap themselves around other food that we love, that we enjoy eating, and are full of fat. Okay? 
Great. Let's put that on one side and take this. Now, this is something we enjoy eating, crusty loaf of bread, but it isn't full of fat. It truly isn't. What we're going to do is we're going to have a look at this and we're going to cut this open, dig out the soft dough, and then fill it with something that we like. For example, if you have a brown stew and you like brown stew, if you have chicken and you love chicken, whatever it may be, fill it, slap it to, wrap it in foil, stick it in the oven, heat it up, cut it in thick wedges through and serve it. It came from this idea, but it doesn't have the fat at the same time. Okay, how's that for a basic idea? Good springboard? All right, let's have a see how that can actually get on your menu. Today on Graham Care's Kitchen, the Peacemaker, Italian bread loaf filled with oysters and Canadian bacon with tomatoes and a saffron yogurt sauce. Okay, Lene, now as I understand it from your recent communication to me, you actually prefer this one than the original one, which is a marvelous. I'm really excited about that. Okay, right, now here's how we actually do it. Um, first of all, the loaf of bread, and you have to find out which side you want to go. Now, you notice this is not the normal shape of French loaf. This is what is called an Italian loaf, as well as a somewhat pregnant French loaf. Um, it's got to be slightly larger in the girth than the normal baguette and deeper as well. So, I mean, uh, let's have a look. Um, this is uh, six inches across and it's very useful, this one, and, um, and 12 inches long. There we go. So, if you've got a friendly local baker, you know what to ask for. Now, here, take, take um, uh, the loaf. You see how this one is almost straight this side and this one is bulbous this side? Well, if it's bulbous, take it on the bulbous edge like that and just um, run a serrated knife through that, keeping your hand tied onto the top. What you don't want to do is get yourself cut through the other side. And um, what I want to do is create one of those kind of living hinges, you know, that you get in plastic boxes that eventually break just when you don't want them to. All right, so then uh, you lift it open and you simply dig out the bread dough. Now. Be, be a little careful how you do this because you, you really don't want to go through the bottom. It's no big deal if you go through the bottom. But I, I don't want to do too much of that digging out. But I do want to get to about um, half an inch to a quarter of an inch um, around the outside here so that it isn't too doughy when you actually present it. In the original dish that I did, and hence the reason when you get to see some of the numbers, um, I poured clarified butter into the bottom of it in order to stop it, I reasoned, from getting soggy. But we've been able to cure that now. And it is slightly soggy, but <laughs> when it's crusty on the outside and slightly soggy on the inside, isn't that just when you love a piece of bread? Okay, so that digs out, quite simple. You've got a whole load of bread here, though. You could put this in the oven, just dry it out a little bit, and uh, you've got the most magnificent breadcrumbs. Or you can keep it, um, tear it off like this, freeze it, and then just drop pieces of it into a soup, a thin soup, and stir it in, and it thickens the soup brilliantly. It really is lovely. Okay, so don't throw that away. Now, um, first things first. Uh, we've got, uh, down here somewhere, here it is, um, a clove of garlic, and uh, we just need to bash that, just to sort of destroy it and bring it down to size, and uh, just pass the blade through it, just to chop it up. Good. And rather a large amount of oil this time, for me anyway. One, two, three, four. That's each one is a, each squirt is a quarter teaspoonful, so one teaspoonful. One, two, three, four. Good. Two teaspoonfuls of oil. That has been a real boon to my life. It really is a discipline without having to stand there with a trembling tablespoon. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, garlic into the top. You notice that it's not sort of a flat-out pan. <clears throat> this is just simmering like this in order to extract the natural volatile oils of the garlic and then I will take it to the side there because, you know, we're going to add a few other little ingredients and I don't want that nasty taste of scorched garlic which can happen. Here is a little slice of Canadian bacon <clears throat> and um, if you just simply pass the knife blade through it like this uh, once and once again like that the other side, you've got a little piece which is... <clears throat> one and three quarter inches by, don't you hate recipes like this? And you, <laughs> you want calipers in order to be able to cook. Okay, by half an inch. All right. Uh, 
don't worry about it because these appear to be a different shape and size altogether. <laughs> the big thing to do is just to get those nicely done up. There's three ounces of Canadian bacon there. For the whole dish, for the whole loaf of bread, I want to be able to sprinkle that in and get it nicely distributed so that goes well. Now here is this little bit of green stuff, which is somewhat wilting, but there we are. This is tarragon. It's a lovely, lovely herb, and it works wonderfully well when you put it together with oysters. Now, in this case, um, you could drape them if you were doing it completely fresh, and if it just would never get frozen, then you could put them in as the whole long uh, leaves. We've got about 10 leaves. Um, thank you, Lenane, for making the point. How on earth do you measure a teaspoonful of tarragon leaves? That's true. Well, you just press them into the teaspoon. That's the way I do it. Um, so you've got here, just, just scatter that in, and that tarragon is going to move with the bacon now and the garlic, and I can get that back on the heat about midway through the heat range, not blistering hot. Matter of fact, recently I've been learning it's no point in getting things blistering hot anyway. These particular pans do very well. They hold the heat nicely, and I, I think it cooks better than the, the, the searing, browning, charcoaling, you know, as if you were in a terrible hurry all the time. All right, so that's doing well there. Now, let's have a look at the oysters, okay? Now, here are oysters. These oysters, these are balance, and you, you see the very flat base that there is to that oyster there, and a rounded curved top. This is kind of the, the European style. Um, these are called shoal waters, and they're sort of rather rotund, and uh, they look quite difficult to get into. As a matter of fact, Janet Anderson, who's um, my producer, you must wait for her name every time that the show's on, you know, in the credit roll. You'll notice it this time. She came in, she said, oh, shucks, oysters, ah, oh, that, oh, that's funny. But she said, you wouldn't mention that, would you? I said, no, I promise you, I wouldn't. Uh, okay, these are Pacifics here, and these can get huge, uh, and they're a kind of rock oyster. Now, now just one thing. Um, if you look at these and say, boy, I know where there's a place where I can just nick down and get those free. Watch it, you know, because there is this paralytic shellfish poisoning that there, there, there is, PSP, right? And, um, and you've got to check locally to make sure there's no red tide around. Just don't go and do this. I'm sorry to have to raise a thing like that. You just think, well, it's natural, and it's in the fresh open air, therefore it's fine. It isn't fine, and we need to watch that. Okay, better to get them in the closed shell like this from a fishmonger you trust and uh, go for it, okay? Good, or ring up locally and find out that everything's okay. Now, here, this is going just brilliantly now. There, just enough of the, what fat there is in this very lean bacon is oozing out into the garlic and the tarragon is just fine. Now, with these oysters, these are the Pacific oyster, and I'm, oh, where's my thing? Here it is. Um, I want to show this to you because it's really quite fun. Um, these, uh, I, I'm, I'm British by my accent, you know, but I'm American now by nationality. Um, and for us, we have things called Wichester and Colchester natives. Okay, those are, are, are the kind of uh, oysters that we have. And they're about an inch, inch and a half long. This is three and a half inches long. <laughs> and these are small. The grade of this one is small, believe it or not. You know, I know there's a mania for everything being large in the United States, but frankly, that's ridiculous. Now, plastic bag, okay, half a, half a cup of flour, just perfectly plain flour, and in there, there's, there's a lot of sodium in here anyway, but it just needs a bit of a help. About one-eighth teaspoonful of sea salt, and an eighth of a teaspoonful of freshly ground black pepper in the, in the bag as well. And if you then uh, shake the bag up together, what obviously you have is well-seasoned flour. Now, take the oysters, and this works very well if you're just going to fry oysters, by the way. Just strain them, first of all, like this. Keep the juice underneath, because it's very valuable. And then sort of make sure that you've trapped air in. There's no need to blow into it. That's rather unsanitary. And then just give it a little shake. <laughs> Do a bit of aerobics, whatever. And, um, and then you're ready with a plate. Get a plate here, and then just, um, just um, drop them out and they will be perfectly, wonderfully done. You know, there's a, there's a dozen and a half oysters there. There's a little bit of extra flour there. You can just shake them up and down on the plate. That's great. Now, put the pan forward. This is all ready and waiting for it. 
and just drop these down into the top, not the extra flour, but uh, because that's been shaken as you sort of pick them up and, uh, and, sh and, and shook them. <laughs> um, just drop it into the dish. Isn't that fun? They look great. Boy. And these are going to be put here just for picking up flavor more than anything else. They're just nestling in there and getting that whole thing sort of combined. Okay, good. And remember this, this is the juice which is left behind. We're going to use that in a moment. Ah, let's just toss these over and see how they're going. Oh, oh, oh they're going nicely. Just, um, that's all they're for, just pick up a little color perhaps, but basically just to be able to absorb some of the flavors and the surplus flour is there to be able to take up some of the spillage when that oyster begins to weep a little <laughs> in the middle, all right? And just as it's in the loaf. I don't want the loaf to get too soggy, so that was the way of being able to do it. Now, a little bit of parsley over the top, about a tablespoonful of parsley, and then here, just <coughs> to squeeze fresh lemon juice and about two tablespoons full of fresh lemon juice just shaken over the top. There, that's fine. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Now, here goes the loaf of bread. And the, all of this then is just shot into the loaf of bread. Um, just there. Perfect. And isn't that nice? And just throw, oh, come on out. <laughs> there's always, have you ever noticed whenever you want a pan to be empty, there's always a little bit that loves to hang on somehow. Isn't it life? Life is seen in a skillet. All right, um, you remember I've been talking about the Viva Italia tomato? Still haven't found one, but still we're, we, we live in hopes they're going to be wonderful, a little bit better than the Romas. These are Romas. Um, just drop those into the pan now. We've got three of those, six portions. There should be one for each in the pan. Just heat that up. These are heating up basically not to cook them, but just to be able to get some of those um, flavors of the oyster up and off the pan. Okay. Here is some yogurt. Now, this is strained yogurt, and good night. By now, I think you know how I strain yogurt. Um, just get non-fat yogurt and pop it in a strainer and hey, it just looks like this after 12 hours. One teaspoonful, there's half a cup there, one teaspoonful of um, uh, horseradish, creamed horseradish, and just a little dusting of saffron into the top. And all you need to do then is just stir the two together and you see it, it goes bright yellow. Isn't that amazing? And it's thick, bright yellow. Now it's got to be nice and thick. I'm trying to make like a pale mayonnaise out of this one. That's about mayonnaise yellow in color. Ah, but now things start to get really exciting. You just um, get the tomatoes from here and you pop those tomatoes on top of the loaf here. Just lay them out so that everybody gets a good portion. Stuff that back on top. Get a good piece of foil and run that in to the top, like so. And just simply fold it up across loosely and pop it into the oven. Now, that is put into the oven at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, just in the middle of the oven there, and then, <laughs> then there's the one, it falls down into the bottom oven, of course, as normal style. And um, hot plates, hot food, and off we go. Now, you can, and I have wrapped it up in muslin, which makes it a much crisper effort, but you can do it this way with a, with, uh, with a foil but, and put it back for about five minutes, all right, just to be able to get it nicely um, crisp. Hmm? This, is, this is a little soggy, so here we go. Um, put this pan on the heat just before you start carving it, and here we go. Uh, the juice which came from the oysters, just drop that into the bottom of the pan, and that is deglazing that pan, right? Just totally shooting it up, and they're wasting absolutely nothing in terms of the quality of that sauce. Pour that then, that's an essence of oyster, on top of 
the sauce that we have. And uh, with that, just a little bit of a stir around, and that makes that um, a, a kind of hot mayonnaise ready to be added to the dish at the end. And remember, it's yogurt and saffron, and that's done. That's all there is to it. Now, here we go. Just um, slice it through, and you get great big thick slices of this. Look, look, look how it looks. Isn't it look fantastic? Look. And just simply put a slice of this hot to the plate, a spoonful of that yogurt saffron sauce on the side, put a little bit of salad there, sprinkle the whole thing with a little bit of parsley, and go through and enjoy what your friends are going to say. It's good stuff. Come on. Ah. Boy, it is such fun too. It's just a great looking thing. Here's the classic with butter in there, mayonnaise in there, and bacon in there, crisp fried bacon. And because of that, this is, makes quite a difference in terms of the numbers. 600 per portion before Lenane in the old days, 336 now. Fat was 33, woo, down to 7. I mean, that's 50% of the day's fat. Um, 11, saturated fat down to 2, that's where it really counts. 50% calories from fat is now 18%, extraordinarily low. Uh, cholesterol at 152, dots to 82. Sodium from 1,055 is down to 838, which is good stuff. Carbohydrate at 46, just about the same. Okay, that's all that bread dough and that's what it does. Now, it's a little bit tricky to eat because you have to sort of carve through the outside portion. But when you get a piece of the sauce and the oyster and the mushroom together and the horseradish just lilts in there, boy, that's good. Well, you just imagine that. You've done the preparation ahead of time. You wrapped it up, stick it in the fridge, and you come home, slip it into the oven, heat it up, take that foil back, crisp it at the last moment, slice through crunchy, wet, beautiful, aromatic in the side, that nice biting sauce at the end. Boy, that's what you call springboarding. Right, thanks for the extra meal, and um, once again into the deep freeze to see what we've got. And I feel a little bit like a coach at a football team, you know, at the uh, midwinter's game. <laughs> it's like, rather like a large football. Um, this has got Peacemaker on it and the date um, uh, all written up and uh, so you know when you put it in. And um, this has got a slight um, uh, coating over the top of it of you know, a, a plastic film. And then these I'll show you how to do in just a moment. But these are the interspaced um, waxed pieces. Now let's say that there's four of you and you're going to just um, have four people. So you find the actual cut there, and with a serrated knife you go through. Now remember, it, it isn't cut all the way through, but it's just that simple to be able to cut off a half a piece of that, and then wrap the rest of it back up. Please do this, because I want to get this completely sealed. This is where food can get freezer burnt if it's not well and truly packaged like this. And then put it back into the package once more, and, um, and you're on your way. All right, reseal it, exhaust all the air out of the bag, and re-zip it. Okay. Now, uh, all you need to do is to put this on a plate in uh, the refrigerator and let it defrost naturally. All right? Don't try and put it into a microwave. You'll do something strange to the bread if you do that. Now, here is the one that I have just finished making. And there it is, all like this. But you'll notice no tomato in it. The tomato will not freeze. Take it out, please. And this is what you do, just to show you um, a cut. You take the cut almost all the way through, and then sheets of waxed paper. Fold them in half, and then just place them over the top, and then with a knife blade, just settle that down in between the cut there. All right. So you just simply take the number of cuts that you want to be able to make in the loaf and just put that wax paper in between, wrap it up in the rest of the film, just like the one that I had before, and you're off and running, you know? Oh, one last thing. Uh, where did I put it? Huh, I saw, oh, here it is. Um, 
What I have in the deep freeze at all times is a menu, and I write it on one of these bags because it's a very useful thing to be able to do. I know I've got oxtail. I know I've got two lots of four portions of oxtail soup that went in on the 27th of the 4th. The turkey balls, three lots of four, went in the 29th of the 5th. So I can survey my menu. When I go to there, I know how to be able to resuscitate it quickly. Boy, I'm so far ahead of the game and being able to avoid the pizza on the way home. God bless. Well, Lonane, thank you so much for the idea and for the very kind note. And uh, there it is, the silver bullet is back in the fridge, this time slightly improved and certainly up to date.